Bruchim Aboim. Last week, um, I began to tell a story that I wrote called The Tale of Two Porters. And last week, we talked about uh, one of the porters, Boris, and again, that he complained about God, and God gave him an opportunity by three, taking three tests through a desert, and then through a mountain, and then through a forest. And if he had passed any one of those tests, he would have been given great wealth. And uh, we read I taught the story last week, talked about his tr travails, and that he did not pass any of those tests. And again, he left dejected. Second part of the story deals with another porter whose name is Beryl. So Beryl was also a porter. He, unlike Boris, would spend his time at the train station waiting for trains to arrive so that he could help passengers and businessmen with their packages. Most of his customers would not only pay him his fee, but they would generally give him a generous tip. He was punctual, polite, and always efficient. He never wasted time. When he wasn't busy with his business, he would open up a safe or a book and learn Torah, which was his true passion. He understood that if there is no flower, there is no, can be no Torah. He had a wife and six children, and his daughters were already at a marriageable age. He lived in a modest home, and he was content with all that God had given him. One day, when he was delivering a package to a personal residence, he knocked at the door, but no one was home. It was a hot day, and so he decided to wait under a big oak tree and enjoy the shade that it offered under its thick branches. He sat down, and with his back against the trunk of the tree, he opened up a safer and began to, began to study. He looked up for a moment, and to his amazement, there seemed to be an angel of God standing in front of him. The angel began to speak to him, and he said, God has seen all that you do, and he has decided to offer you great wealth. <laughs> Beryl said to the angel, what do I need with great wealth? I have all that I need now. Why would I want to be bothered with the burden of riches? The angel said to him, that it may be true that you don't need or want wealth. But what about your wife who struggles daily to make ends meet in the small and run-down hut that you call home? Don't you have three daughters? What about their dowries? And imagine what you could do for the poor who would benefit from your generosity. You know, sometimes we have to leave our comfort zone and do things for others. The angel then told him, don't think this will be a gift You'll have to earn it. There will be three tests, a desert, a mountain, and a forest. If you pass all three, your reward will be great. and You'll get immense wealth, and you'll be able to help your family and all those around you. So reluctantly, Beryl agreed. The angel gave him a manual and told him to study it. He told Beryl that in the manual he would find instructions as to how to best succeed at the three tests that he would be required to pass. He also told Beryl that he would be taking him to a luxurious inn to spend the night to prepare for his test, which would begin at 6 a.m. the following morning. In the meantime, Boris was home, more bitter than ever. He felt that God had once again treated him unfairly. Granted, God had offered him an opportunity for great wealth, but the tests, the tests were unreasonable and beyond the reach of any person. God was just playing games with him again. He had learned nothing from his ordeal, and he had gained absolutely nothing. Suddenly, the same angel appeared to Boris in a vision, and he said to Boris, God has heard your complaints. He knows that you feel that he was unfair with you, and so he told me to take you with me to watch someone else who was given the same test as you were given with one major difference. He has to complete all three tests to receive his reward. Not like you, who only had to complete one. You will not be able to see the person, but you'll be able to see and hear everything that he does. He will not know that you are watching him. He will only see me. Now, I have already informed him of his test, and I'm about to take him to the inn. The angel then asked Boris, would you like to come along? Boris was intrigued. 
<laughs> Somehow he thought that watching someone else fail would make him feel better about his own failure and prove once and for all that God had never treated him fairly in the first place. So the angel escorted Beryl to the luxurious inn with Boris able to hear and see everything that was said or done. The only thing he couldn't see was Beryl's face. The angel introduced Beryl to the innkeeper and as before he was very polite and friendly even offering to show Beryl personally to his room. The angel told Beryl that he would be in he, that he would be at his room at 6 a.m. the next morning to pick him up and to take him into the desert for his first test. He told him to remember to study the man manual. Beryl nodded and followed the innkeeper to his room. When Beryl walked into his suite, he turned to the innkeeper and he said, all I need was a plain, simple room. The suite wasn't necessary. The innkeeper just shrugged and said this was the room that he had been reserved for him. He then told Beryl about the designer clothes and shoes that he would find in the closet and that dinner would be served in one hour in the dining room. Beryl thanked the innkeeper for his hospitality, but he said there was no need for any fancy clothes or shoes, nor did he intend to go down to the dining room for dinner. He said that he had some bread and herring in his pack. He would eat in his room. The innkeeper tried to explain to him just how special and delicious the food was. Uh, but Beryl politely thanked him and said good night. Boris, who was listening and watching all of this, was speechless. <laughs> he couldn't believe that Beryl refused all the amenities that he was offered. He watched as Beryl ate the bread and herring in his room, studied the manual, learned from his safer, and then prepared to go to sleep. Beryl got into this plush, king-sized bed. <laughs> he tossed and turned. He found it uncomfortable. It was not what he was used to. So he took the blanket off the bed, placed it on the floor, laid down, and fell into a restful sleep. Boris was in shock. He couldn't believe what he had just witnessed. And there was Beryl, <laughs> snoring away, sleeping comfortably on the floor. He thought to himself, oh, this may all be fine tonight, but wait until Beryl is faced with the desert in the morning. 6 a.m. Beryl was down in the lobby waiting for the angel. He was wearing the special clothing that he found in his room. Lightweight, light colored material that would breathe in special shoes that would help him to cross the desert. He was wearing his hat. He had sunscreen on, water, sunglasses, and his compass. He was ready for his first test. The angel took Beryl to the desert. He pointed to a large sand dune in the distance and told him that his mission was to reach the other side of that sand dune. Beryl checked his compass and saw that he was facing east. And so he followed the compass until it pointed due south. And then he began to walk towards a large sand dune. The morning air was cool since the sun had not yet risen. And Beryl found the sand under his feet firm. He walked for hours and the sun was now coming up in the sky and the temperature was rising quickly. But Beryl pushed on. After about three hours of walking, all of a sudden the wind began to pick up and the sun began blowing in his face. The ground under his feet felt much heavier than before. Beryl took out his compass and realized that he had drifted off course. It was not going, it was not going south anymore. He corrected his error. And suddenly the wind died down and the ground became, became firm again under his feet. Three hours later at noon, the sun was high in the sky and the heat was unbearable. But that wasn't a problem for Beryl. He was on the other side of the sand dune. He had passed the first test. Boris was impressed. But Beryl still had two more tests to conquer. Granted, it was a good start. But that wouldn't be enough for him to receive all the wealth that he had been offered. And the angel took Beryl back to the inn. <clears throat> the innkeeper was there to greet them. He informed Beryl about the curative baths. And Bar Beryl cheerfully accepted the invitation. He was tired. His body was sore from the sun and the sand. And it seemed like everything hurt. <laughs> a curative bath sounded just perfect. After his bath, he felt like a new man, rested and refreshed. The innkeeper informed him that dinner would be served in the dining room in an hour. 
and that he would find new clothing and shoes in his suite. Mbero politely thanked him, but said that he would eat alone in the room. And before the innkeeper could say anything else, Beryl excused himself, turned, and was on his way to his room. He ate quickly and then sat down to study the manual for tomorrow's test on the mountain. Boris watched in amazement. Beryl rejected all the pleasures that he had so gladly accepted. Beryl was focused, pardon me, yeah, Beryl was focused and determined to fulfill his mission. Boris was able to see the pages and even the words that were in the manual, and he was shocked when he saw that the manual gave all the answers and how best to navigate the challenge of the mountain with greater ease and efficiency. The manual warned that being early was crucial since the afternoon weather would make the climb much more difficult. It also kept repeating this necessity to always check the compass to be certain that you were heading due south. It explained how to use the ropes and locking carabiners, the importance of the harness, the helmet, the poles, and the picks. It emphasized the necessity of always wearing all the proper clothing. The manual warned that the climb might seem easy at the beginning, but that it would become more difficult, especially as he got closer and closer to the top. But if he followed the instructions, he could be certain of success. He closed the manual, certain that he knew all that he needed. He opened his safer and studied for a while. His eyes became heavy, and after all, he had had a long and trying day. He was more than ready for sleep. Again, he took the blanket off the bed, laid it on the floor, and in seconds was snoring away. Boris could only think of his night of eating, drinking, and dancing. What a difference a day makes, or better yet, how a different person can make a day different. 6 a.m. Beryl was in the lobby waiting for the angel. He was greeted with a big smile. The angel took him to the mountain and gave him his instructions. The morning air was cold and Beryl was glad he was wearing all his winter gear. He took out his compass located south and began his climb. As long as he climbed in a southerly direction, the test was relatively easy. And he now understood that when the terrain would suddenly become overly difficult, he would check his compass and would realize he had drifted off course. As he climbed higher, the air became thinner and the temperature began to drop. But he had been warned about everything in the manual. Suddenly, he was in a blizzard, and he checked his compass and realized he had drifted off course again. He was amazed how quickly one can lose their concentration, even when you think you're focused. Now he reached the steepest part of the climb, then he reached for his harness and his safety ropes. And even with the special climbing shoes, he still fell back numerous times and was grateful for the harness and the safety ropes. The wind was blowing and the snow was falling and his whole body ached. And he labored to pull himself up to the top of the mountain. After almost six hours of climbing, he reached the top. He looked down the mountain and he could see the place where he had started his climb. And to his amazement, he felt a strange sense of accomplishment that he had reached the top. Morris, too, was impressed. Together, Beryl and the angel went back to the inn, and again, the innkeeper was there to greet them. He complimented Beryl on his success and again suggested he might enjoy soaking for a while in the curative baths. Beryl thanked him. It seemed that every bone in his body ached. One hour later, he was a new man, refreshed and rejuvenated. The innkeeper complimented him on how good he looked and said they should celebrate his great success with a delicious meal and some special wine. Again, he politely thanked the innkeeper for his offer, but declined and said he'd be going up to his room to prepare for the test the next day. The innkeeper said he understood and offered to have a special meal sent up to his room. Beryl agreed, but only to a very simple meal. The innkeeper had a meal sent up to his room <laughs> with much more than Beryl had ordered or wanted, and also a fine bottle of wine, which he never opened. He ate only what he needed and then began to study the manual. The instructions for the forest were really very, relatively simple. Ten different challenges, each a little different than the other. Time and direction would be critical for him to succeed. He would be given a watch, a compass, and a flashlight. The test would take ten hours. And if he would complete one section, 
the next would begin on the hour. If you were late for any section, the test would end and you would receive nothing. On the other hand, if he completed this last test, he would be given his reward of great wealth. He was warned again about two things, not to look left, right, or backwards, and not to eat from any of the fruits that he would find in the forest. So 6 a.m. next morning, early as usual, Beryl was in the lobby when the angel entered the inn. The angel took Beryl to the forest, gave him his final instructions and warnings, and he wished him good luck. Boris watched as Beryl began his final test. He checked his compass, found south, and began to walk into the forest. In the first section, the path was wide, well lit. <clears throat> he came to the first wall that was covered with ivy, and exactly on the hour, a large opening appeared, and he entered the second section. He checked his compass just as the manual had instructed. <laughs> and he found that south was to his left, not the path that was directly in front of him. The trees were blocking the sun, and the light wasn't as bright as the first section. He followed the path to a wall covered with vines and luscious grapes. He felt a strong urge to reach up and taste a grape, but he remembered the warning and controlled his desire. And then suddenly, an opening appeared, not as large as the first. He stepped into the third section. Before he moved forward, he checked his compass. The light was dimmer and it was turning into shadows, but he could still see the face of the compass. And somehow, south was not the large path in front of him, but a smaller path to the right. It was then that he realized, just like Boris, that he was in a maze. The wall at the end of the third section was covered with dates, full and luscious, that were dripping with honey. He looked, but he did not touch. And exactly on the hour, the fourth section opened up. The opening was smaller than the last, but he, but he entered easily. When the door shut behind him, he now realized why he needed a flashlight. He could not make out the face of the compass at all. In the low light, he located the path heading south and began to walk. He reached the wall at the end of the fourth section, which he could see was covered with figs, ripe and luscious. But though he was truly tempted, he only looked, but, he di but did not touch. The fifth door opened exactly on the hour. The doorway again was narrower. He was now in total darkness, and he had to keep the flashlight on all the time to see the path. He checked his compass, found south, and began to walk. The darkness around him seemed to put his mind to sleep. Boredom was setting in, but he just kept walking. He felt a light rain begin to fall on his face, and suddenly it began to pour. He was startled by this loud sound of thunder and bright flashes of lightning. He was cold and wet. And then he realized he had not checked his compass for a while. He looked down at his compass, and now he understood why the weather had changed so suddenly. He had drifted off course, and he was walking west. He turned and began walking south, and as he became closer and closer to due south, the rain began to lighten. And when he was back to due south again, the rain stopped completely. He then realized that he had to stay focused or he would not succeed. He picked up the pace, and he just made it to the sixth door, exactly on the hour. He looked up, and a smaller door opened, and he stepped into the sixth section. Beryl checked his compass and found south, and he realized the path he was walking on also seemed narrow, that he had just, but he just walked forward, not looking right, left, or backwards. He was focused. He continued to the sixth, the seventh, the eighth and the ninth sections. And with each section, he could see the doorways were getting narrower and narrower, and so were the paths. He felt a great desire to take the flashlight and look around to exactly where he was and what was on either side of the path he was walking on. But he remembered the warning and only looked forward. Boris, who was with him the whole time, marveled at Beryl's self-control. <laughs> but there was still the tenth and final section to pass. Finally, Beryl came to the wall at the end of the ninth, ninth section. He waited for the doorway to open. He was tired, hungry, and thirsty. He was curious and a little apprehensive as to what great challenges waited for him behind the last and final doorway. He didn't have to wait long. His thoughts were interrupted as the wall opened and a doorway appeared. The opening was so narrow that he wasn't even sure that it was a doorway. 
he had to turn his body sideways and squeeze through the narrow opening. When he reached the other side, he froze. He was totally blinded by the bright light. His eyes finally adjusted, and he looked around. He could see that straight ahead was a glass door, and behind it, all the wealth that he had been promised. However, as he looked around, what he saw was even more spectacular than what lie behind the glass doors. He thought to himself, this surely is the Garden of Eden. So beautiful, so serene. The picture before his eyes was more spectacular than anything he had ever seen before. Exquisite flowers, beautiful trees, luscious fruits, vines, beautiful birds, exotic butterflies, beauty beyond words. It was breathtaking. He started to walk down the path towards the last door, but he stopped and checked his compass. And to his surprise, south was behind not in front of him. He hesitated. He was confused. But he started walking backwards, away from the tent door instead of towards it. It was totally against his logic. But the manual was very clear. He was always to travel south, no exceptions. He walked on, tired and hungry, looking at the luscious fruits so tempting, hanging low on the branches of the trees. Wanting to taste one, but he fought off the temptation. His legs ached, he was in pain and exhausted. It had been a long, difficult day. He saw a big oak tree on the side of the road. He wanted to stop and rest under its shady branches. But he pushed on, walking further and further away from the glass door with all the riches. Finally, he came to a plain wall. And he looked at his watch. It was exactly on the hour. And a doorway opened, and he stepped forward. And before him was more wealth than he'd ever seen in his entire life. The angel then informed him that he had passed all three tests and that now he would have one hour to gather all the wealth that he could place into one railroad car and that he could take all that with him as his just reward. Somehow, he was no longer hungry or tired. His whole body felt completely rejuvenated, just as if he had spent the hour in the curative bath. He loaded the railroad car to the brim and then a locomotive connected to it and took it all to his hometown. Boris was stunned and speechless. Beryl had succeeded where he had failed. Beryl became a wealthy and prosperous businessman. He bought a beautiful home for his wife, married off his three daughters. He became known as a philanthropist whose home and pocketbook were always open to the poor. Boris was impressed. God had allowed him to see all that Beryl had accomplished. He had watched as Beryl faced and conquered the same challenges that he had tried and failed to complete. The lesson was not lost on him. He knew and understood that what he had experienced wasn't a dream. And if it was, it was a wake-up call. The next morning, Boris was at the train station early, even before the trains arrived. And when they came into the station, he was ready to take care of his business. He became successful. People who would come off the trains would look for him to help them with their baggage or mer merchandise. Everyone admired his attention to time and detail. He always had a pocket watch hanging from his vest, then a compass in his pocket, so that he would always be on time and never get lost. He became so proficient, he had to hire workers to help him take care of all of his many customers that wanted to use his services. Beryl may not have passed any of the three tests that the angel had offered him, pardon me, Boris, but he had definitely found and secured the secret to success and happiness, dedication and perseverance. God willing, next week we'll deal with the epilogue and also the overview of these two porters and their lives. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and have a great day. Shabbos. Thank you.